Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Emmaus Road Church. I'm glad you can be here with us, whether you're here in person or joining us online. And today the kids are in service and we are so excited to have you. And my family is not here yet, so there will be some more kids here in a few minutes, I hope. <laughs> um, and just as a reminder, we have our focus bags that are behind these two walls under the coat racks if you need something to keep your hands a little bit busy while you're trying to listen. And for our littles with wiggles, we have a wiggle corner back there. So don't be afraid to use those things if you need them. Um, and today I'm going to begin service by lighting our Christ candle. We light this candle to remember that God is with us and to mark this as a special time that we set aside to come together and worship God. And Debbie, will you come up and get, lead us in a call to worship? Good morning. It's great to worship with you this morning. Please join me in our call to worship. This will be a responsive reading, so please join us as instructed on the screen. Jesus said, ask and it will be given you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. Lord, as we enter your presence now, guide us. As we knock, open the door to us. Make us more aware of your presence and lead us on, that we may know you and bring you praise. Please stand with us as we worship the Lord this morning. Oh, 
and for the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. And for the beauty of each hour of the day our hymn of grateful praise and for the beauty of human love brother sister parent child friends on earth and friends above for all gentle thoughts and our hymn of grateful praise. And for thyself as gift divine, to the world so freely given, for that great, great love of thine, peace on together experiencing all things ranging from joy and peace and happiness to question or doubt or discouragement but God we know that as we gather together that you meet us and Lord as our worship has reminded Lord you are here make us aware of your presence and God as you interact with us as we interact you today. God, we ask that you would align our hearts, comfort us, guide us. Church, in this moment of worship, I invite you to just uh, enter into this mode of silence. We'll just have a short moment of silent prayer, allowing you to bring your requests.
church as we do each week. I invite you to join me in our corporate prayer. This prayer will be on the screens for you. Please join us, we pray. Almighty God, who sent the promised power of the Holy Spirit to fill disciples with willing faith. We confess that at times we resist your spirit among us, that we are slow to serve you, and reluctant to spread the good news of your love. God, have mercy on us. Forgive our divisions, and by your spirit, draw us together. Inflame us with the desire to do your will, to be your faithful people for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Church, Ezekiel 20, 36 reminds us that I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give to you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's beautiful. Please join me in saying, thanks be to God.
have great singing. Uh, let's turn and greet each other in the name of the Lord this morning. Children, you will be with us in the service. Let's greet each other. Good morning, everyone. I am glad we're all having fun chatting with each other. But now we're going to start with our sermon. I'm Pastor Grace, in case you haven't met me yet. And I need to confess something. I'm a Trekkie. And you guys can all thank Jay Dare for that, obviously. So at the beginning of the pandemic lockdown, um, I started to wake up before Rose did, my little girl, and it was just her at that time, because I needed some alone time, you know what I mean? And um, I was tired of my usual shows, and Netflix rec recommended Star Trek, The Next Generation. And I thought, well, Jay loves Star Trek. I'm going to give this a shot. And I'm hooked, maybe a little too hooked, because once I told Jason that you could actually rock out to the theme song to the series Enterprise, which is like notoriously like the worst theme song introduction in the known galaxy, right? So I think maybe I need an intervention someday, but not today, please. But, <laughs> and I think I've seen all the tracks now and Strange New Worlds is so good. You guys should watch it. But um, Voyager is maybe my favorite. Um, to rewatch, and I recently watched a couple episodes centered around uh, the character Neelix, and uh, Neelix is an alien from Talex and uh, in the Delta Quadrant, and he ends up joining the Voyager crew 
in the first episode of the series. And Neelix gets a lot of hate from the Star Trek fans because um, he is a very silly character. And then his costuming is also quite silly because um, they're trying to make him look like not a human while well, he is being a human without like expensive prosthetics. So it's basically just like clown makeup, clown hair, and then a weird trench coat or something that he's, <laughs> he's in. He's like made to be an obvious comic relief. And I think the ridiculousness of, of him is why people don't like him. But that is just the surface of Neelix. And as the series progresses, we learn that his silliness is just a show that he puts on. It's a mask. And yes, he's very funny and a silly person, but he uses that part of himself to hide himself, the other parts of himself, because he's afraid to be hurt and truly known. He works so hard to be useful on the ship and be helpful because he's afraid he'll be kicked off the ship if he doesn't pull his weight. He works so hard to fit in and to be liked. And he feels a lot of shame about his past, about what he's done and who he used to be. And he thinks he'll be abandoned. But eventually, his mask starts to come off as the series goes on. And those are some of my favorite episodes. Um, in one episode, he confronts his wartime trauma as a war criminal is welcomed aboard, aboard the Voyager under false pretenses. And his mask comes off again when he reveals his less than sparkly history to the crew after a big incident. And the mask comes off when he dies and is brought back to life by Borg technology and wrestles with his beliefs and the meaning of life. The parts of himself that embarrass Neelix or cause him shame come to light, but the crew still embraces him and love him, and his relationships become stronger and more genuine as he becomes honest with himself and with others. But he's still silly. And just like our silly Talaxian alien Neelix, we Earthlings are also good at putting a show on, aren't we? We try to hide what embarrasses us or what we're ashamed of because we want people to think the best of us, right? And that's not like a bad idea. Like you want to dress nice for a job interview, right? <laughs> but we can use it as a mask. And sometimes, Maybe we go into a wild cleaning frenzy before our friends come over to make your house look really good and like you're on top of everything when you're in fact not. And if you guys saw my garden bed and all the weeds in it, you guys would be worried probably. <laughs> I'm not on top of that, I'll be honest. <laughs> but we try to hide these silly things that make us feel incompetent or less than. We try to hide our failures and only recognize our successes. Maybe you get all the best grades because you want to please people, or you do the best at sports to make people happy or think great things about you. And sometimes we can put up this defensive mask because we've been hurt and we want to protect ourselves, and that's the way we know how. And other times it's just fear or a desire to be fitting in and to be liked, or related to our pride. In our faith, we put on a mask too. Maybe the mask of happiness, because that shows that we're somehow a really good Christian, and we don't struggle with anything, and we don't want to be a bad testimony to the goodness of God. Or we put on a mask of knowledge when we try to know everything or have something to say about everything because we want to be smart and seem like we know the Bible so well. There are many ways we put on a mask to have others think the best of us. And let's keep this in mind as we explore this next section of scripture from the Sermon on the Mount. 
Before we get into that next section, though, the Sermon on the Mount series has been going on for a while and many weeks, and Jesus preached this as just one sermon, which seems a little overwhelming, like it's a lot to take in. We're doing it over several weeks because there's so much to take in and digest and think about and let sink in and shape us. But at first, when people heard it all at once, it was probably a lot easier to connect everything and have it seem like one sermon instead of like, I don't know, how many, how many sermons is this, Daniel? Like 15? 15. I'm just going with that number. I made it up. But so let's do a little bit of a recap so we can remember how we're all connecting in the Sermon on the, on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount tells us what God's kingdom is like. It gives us an ethic to live by. God's kingdom is not fully realized yet, but it is breaking in. God's kingdom is breaking into our messy world and turning it right side up. God's kingdom is a drastic difference from what the world is. Our values are reordered, and the people who are on the edge of the society who are left out or forgotten, receive the good news that God's grace is for them too. The Sermon on the Mount reminds us that we are part of God's kingdom coming to earth. The church is to live in the present just as we would in the promised future. And maybe this is ringing some bells with Daniel's sermon, Pastor Daniel's sermon last week about being the salt and light. And now today, we hear from Matthew 6, verses 1 through 8, and then verses 15 through 18. And the part in between those is the Lord's Prayer. So I'm leaving it out because next week we'll be digging into that, because that would be a really long sermon today if I did all of that at once. So you're welcome. It was Daniel's idea, not mine. (laughs) So I will read it to you. If you don't know how to read, you do not have to try it and follow along with words. Um, You can just listen. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that you may be giving in secret, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father, who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But... When you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For people back in the time of Jesus, almsgiving, prayer, and fasting were standard religious practices that showed one's devotion to God. And Jesus' teaching highlights how important these are and clarifies that the purpose is to center God, not ourselves. It's not a show that we put on. Jesus calls us to live in a way where our outward expressions match perfectly with our inward reality. Almsgiving is when we give money on behalf of the poor. It is a regular part of religious life in Christianity, as well as a lot of other religions. And so Jesus is telling us that almsgiving must be done out of sincere faith. It is not to uh, get attention or to make you look like 
You are so devoted to God and giving so much money. A hypocrite is someone who is not hip with it. That's just a reference to a silly camp song. A hypocrite is actually, when you have a children's pastor preaching, you have to expect something silly like that to show up. So a hypocrite is actually someone who appears one way, but is really another way on the inside. They perform behind a mask. Someone who claims to believe a certain thing, but doesn't actually live it out, or it's not truly genuine to them. So Jesus describes the hypocrites as blowing a trumpet to attract attention as they go to take their offerings to the synagogue, which is kind of like a funny image to have in your head, right? And now I lost my spot. Just a second. Oh, yeah. So, and then Jesus says, and they do this to get noticed, and they have that reward, which is a little sad because they miss the actual reward of giving to the poor. They don't understand true generosity. So Jesus tells us to do it the exact opposite way so that your left hand doesn't even know that your right hand is doing it, which is like the most opposite you could probably be from blowing your trumpet and throwing money, right? In God's kingdom, our values are reordered and people, oh, I think I missed this spot, you guys. Your generosity is impactful on your community, even when they don't know it's you giving the money or don't have a chance to thank you or when you don't have your name on a building. Perhaps the real reward is more than getting the attention from the action. In God's kingdom, we reorder our values to include people who have been left out. God's, God's grace is for those people too. And almsgiving is for people who have been on the edge of society. This is a way that heaven begins to meet earth. It is a way we partner with God's kingdom work by helping provide care for those who need it and lifting them up. Secondly, Jesus talks about prayer. And prayer is a way that we connect with God. It's not a public performance. It is not magic words or a special formula that we have to say. We don't have to sound like we memorized a thesaurus. And we don't have to sound like we know the Bible forwards and backwards. Although if you can do those things, that is really impressive. But that's not what prayer is about. We can use our own language, our ordinary speaking when we pray, which is great because it means more to us than if we were trying to be fancy or make up a lot of different words to express a word that perfectly would fit that we're used to using. We don't need to get lost in sounding amazing. We can just come to God as we are. But even that can be hard. How do we know what to say? How do we come to God in prayer? And pre-written prayers are really helpful with this because they can give you something to say when you don't know where to start. Or they can challenge us by giving us something to pray about that we would never have considered. Um, there's this little book here called Prayers for Faithful Families by Tracy Smith. And I'll put, I'll put it at the communion table so you guys can take a peek after service if you'd like. So that's like a little family um, prayer book that you could refer to if you want some help. Um, but sometimes praying, our struggle is just focus because we can get distracted. Because sometimes it feels like we're talking to ourselves, right? But when you have something that can help you like incorporate your senses, that can engage you in the prayer. So like, um, using Play-Doh or kinetic sand or like a clay while you are doing that or while you're making pizza dough and then you also get pizza after. So that's a bonus. But doing that with your hands can help engage you into that prayer. And you could even like use that to shape it into what you're praying about. Um, you can light a candle to mark your time of prayer. The smell can remind you of God's presence that is with you. 
and the light might be something to focus on, and you can contemplate that Jesus is the light. You may also just write your prayers down. Good old-fashioned technology of the pencil and paper. Or you could break out a stone and chisel, right? Just kidding. But that, just writing things down, not typing them, but the intention of writing and thinking as you are doing that can help you focus. Now, as we remember and celebrate that God's grace is for everyone, as we are learning that through the Sermon on the Mount, we also remember that prayer doesn't have to be theatrical. God meets us where we are. It is ordinary communication with an extraordinary God who doesn't care if we sound ordinary or we use fancy thesaurus words. And that really seems like the true reward, doesn't it? We come to God as we are, and God meets us. Now, thirdly, Jesus talks about fasting. Fasting is when people refrain from eating for a period of time to devote themselves to God. And fasting is still a common practice in Christianity, most, most commonly during Lent. Um, but it is when people refrain from things, not just food, which is helpful if you already kind of have a strained relationship with food. You don't need to test all those boundaries. You can fast from the internet or fast from spending money. There are many unique ways people have chosen to fast and utilize this spiritual practice. When Jesus was giving this sermon, um, it was common that when someone was fasting, they would kind of let their hair go tangly and their beards and smear ashes on their faces. And again, the hypocrites are being accused of performing. It had become a show. N not that the intention originally was to put on a show and say, look at me, look, I'm fasting. But it had become that. They were missing the point again. Genuine fasting is not looking miserable and trying to prove your devotion to God. Genuine, prayer, genuine fasting is a prayer in action. It's a lived out lamentation. It's repentance and renewal. The prophet Isaiah called Israel to fast, and it was a fast for justice in the land. They were physically hungry while fasting but also hungry for justice. Fasting is a way we connect with God and partner with God's work in the world. When we fast, we can give something up that is becoming a distraction from focusing on God, but we can also give something that's really good, give up something that's really good. And then when the feast comes after the fast, we can like really enjoy all that food so we're not like, oh, I'm going to give up something that's really awful. And then you like do it a lot when you start feasting, because that's not right. <laughs> but <laughs> you can fast from something really good and then really celebrate with that and enjoy it. Like I've given up coffee before. Pretty jittery after. But <laughs> that's just, anyway. <laughs> but I love the idea of fasting as a prayer in action. So whichever way you choose to fast, it is an expression of lamentation, of repentance and renewal. It is a way of connecting with God and partnering with God's work in the world. Almsgiving, prayer, and fasting were and are standard religious practices that show devotion to God. And they are good. But Jesus encourages us to check our motivations, to check that our internal beliefs are genuinely being reflected in the world. It is easy to get distracted when we try to present ourselves as really good Christians or feeling like we need to prove God's goodness, and it becomes like a mask. But we do not earn God's forgiveness and love with good behavior or impressive religious demonstrations. God's love is not earned and it is free for everyone. The Sermon on the Mount reminds us about this all the time, apparently, throughout every portion of it. We are called to remove our masks. 
Neelix, our silly Talaxian alien, had parts of himself that embarrassed him and caused him shame and sadness, and it made him afraid to be real with the people around him because he did not want to be alone. But as he is basically forced into confronting all of these things in public ways on the ship, we find that the Voyager crew embraces him anyway, and his relationships become stronger and more genuine. He becomes an influential caretaker for some of the kids on the ship. He develops a really close friendship with Catherine Janeway, the captain, who is alone in the Delta Quadrant and doesn't have a way to communicate with Starfleet, the people who are her support. And he becomes that support for her. He becomes a confidant and friend to all of his crewmates. His mask came off and he found genuine relationships, which is crazy because he put that mask up so that he would, he would not be alone. But he found that he was alone with that mask. He found genuine relationships when he took that mask off. We are called to remove our masks and genuinely connect with God. We can do that in a lot of ways, including the almsgiving, prayer, and fasting that Jesus talked about in our scripture today. Our connection with God shapes us and teaches us and guides us. We become God's salt and light in the world and we announce hope that is for all people. As we live out our genuine internal faith, we are joining God's work of bringing heaven to earth. Let's now gather around the Lord's table. If you are worshiping with us from home, you can get supplies that represent communion for you. Um, I will wear a mask while I serve communion and I'll sanitize my hands and use tongs to serve it. Um, and you guys can all form a single line down the center aisle. And you can make a bowl with your hands, and I'll just drop it in your hands. And I will say, the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. And you can respond with a traditional response of thanks be to God. Then you can grab a cup of the grape juice from the table, from the silver tray, and you can consume the elements here or at your seat, wherever you're more comfortable. And then there are also gluten-free elements available if you need those. Let's prepare ourselves to receive communion. Open our eyes, Lord Jesus, to receive your light and be your light. May we see you in this common bread and in our common lives, in our hunger and our fullness, in our suffering and our joys in our waiting and in our hope. Feed us also with bread unseen. Open our hearts, Lord, and fill our cups to overflowing. Prepare your table of blessing even in the presence of our enemies. May we reflect your light to the world with compassion for the poor and passion for justice and liberation for the oppressed. Pour for us the cup of heaven. Come to the table of the Lord you who are longing for God's face, you who are weary from the world, you who have fed on the bread of sorrow, you who have quenched your thirst with tears, come, for the table is ready. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. As we gather around the Lord's table, I invite you to join me in proclaiming the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. On the night which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me.
the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. Having celebrated the generosity of God in receiving communion, we now commit ourselves to living lives of generosity to others. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human heart into ruin and pierces it with many griefs. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds, willing to share all that we have, laying up for ourselves treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. Amen. If you are in need of financial support during this time, 
please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And if you're able to support this ministry, we would greatly appreciate that. Now I'll invite uh, Rick Edwards to come up and lead us in the prayers of the people. Each week when we pray together, we pray kind of four different types of prayers. One are prayers of praise and adoration, prayers of thanksgiving, then our prayers of request to God, and then we usually recite together the Lord's Prayer as the fourth and final movement of our prayers. And this morning, I invite you to uh, find a posture of prayer that works for you. Most of us often close our eyes during prayer, but for this first movement of prayer, the praise and adoration, I'd invite you to keep your eyes open, pray with your eyes open, and there'll be some images on the screen that will help us in our prayers. And we'll close together as usual with the words of the Lord's Prayer on the screens as well for those who might want to read from there. So let's pray. The heavens declare your glory, O oh God. The skies proclaim the work of your hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words. No sound is heard from them. And yet, their message goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Lord, we praise you from the heavens praise you in the heights above. We call upon the sun and the moon to praise God. Praise God, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at your command they were created. Just as your creation is good and perfect, so are your teachings, Lord. They refresh our souls. Your statutes, Lord, are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Your truths are right, giving joy to our hearts. And your commands are radiant, giving light to our eyes. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. And your faithfulness continues through all generations and we praise your wonderful name. Lord, because you're the giver of all good things, we take this time to thank you for all that you've given to us. We thank you for the universe that you created with all its marvelous order, its atoms, worlds, and galaxies, and for revealing yourself personally to us as we probe the mysteries of your creation. And through that knowledge, more surely fulfill our role in your purposes. We're grateful today that for our sakes, Christ became poor. And by his riches that you've given to us, we may be a help and a blessing to other people. We give thanks that you hear our prayers, as weak and short-sighted as they sometimes may be. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who, when we do not know how we ought to pray, intercedes for us beyond the reach of words. Let's reflect for a moment silently to consider all the other good things that God has given for, to you and then give God thanks. Most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, for the truth of his word and the example of his life, for his steadfast obedience by which he overcame temptation and for his dying through which he overcame death and for his rising again in which we are raised to the life of your kingdom. 
and now in the confidence that if we ask anything according to your will that you'll provide what we need we bring to you our requests Lord we ask that you would grant that the words that we've heard this day with our ears may through your grace soak deep into our hearts that they may guide us to be the salt and light that is attractive to others and brings honor and praise to your name create in us the heart of true disciples who serve you and our neighbors through the habits and the practices that you have taught us, such as prayer and fasting and giving. Lord, we humbly ask that you would free us from the defect of hypocrisy, the putting on of masks. Help us to be genuinely generous. Help us to be personal and persistent in our prayers. And give us focus and wisdom in our fasting. Lord, we ask that you would look graciously on us, this congregation at Emmaus Road, and guide those who are leading our pastoral search, that we may receive a faithful pastor who will care for us, your people, and equip us for our ministries. Today we remember before you all the poor and neglected persons whom it would be easy for us to forget. The homeless and the destitute, the old and the sick, and all those who have no one to care for them. Help us to heal those who are broken in body or spirit, that their sorrows may be turned into joy. Now I invite you to consider your own lives, your own friends or family or something in your own life. Take a moment and add your own silent requests to these that we've mentioned. As members of your kingdom, we remember and we pray together the prayer that you taught your first disciples, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. My name is Cole Zawadzki. It's been such a pleasure worshiping with all of you this morning. Um, as we have worshiped together in song and in the word and in gathering at the table and in prayer, I now invite you to hold out your hands as we receive this commission inspired by our worship today. Go now in the freedom of the gospel of Christ. Encourage one another to lead lives worthy of God and walk together in service and humility. Let your words and your lives be one in Christ. And may the God of lasting love open the way before you. May Jesus the Messiah be your one instructor. And may the Holy Spirit lead you on into the promised land of God's kingdom and glory. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. As we extinguish the Christ candle, know this. The Lord goes with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Hello, I'm Cole's singing a voice today. Would you, would you please join us and join me in singing the doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise for 
before you skedaddle, there are a few announcements for you guys. So on Tuesday, this Tuesday at 6 p.m., we are going to meet up at City Park um, for a food truck rally dinner. So if you can join us, come along and bring a chair. And um, I think if you RSVP, you can do that on the website. Is that right? Okay. And also next Sunday, July 24th, um, before church at 9.30, we are gonna have a little farewell reception for Madeline who just sang the doxology for us. Um, she has been a joy to have with us the last, what, like two years? Two years, two years, something like that. Um, so we just wanna wish her a farewell and we'll have some refreshments there. Um, and then we have Emmaus Lake Day. It's listed as Sunday. It is, it's Sunday? Okay. <laughs> Guys, I <laughs> thought it was Saturday. Okay, so good thing I'm up here giving this announcement, so I'm not there the wrong day. So it is Sunday, next Sunday, the 24th from 4 to 8 p.m. And we will meet at Horse Tooth Reservoir, South Bay Beach, for an afternoon of sun, paddles, and swimming. And there is a $10 entrance fee per vehicle. Um, so let us know if you want to carpool with somebody and we can work out a way so that not everybody is paying separate entry fees. Um, and we will meet up at the South Bay Picnic Shelter where there are restrooms, picnic tables, and charcoal grills. And there's a swim be beach and a boat launch for paddle boards, canoes, and kayaks. So we look forward to being together. Um, and we have one last exciting announcement. Um, we have invited a pastoral candidate uh, and they have agreed to come preach and uh, we are working out a date for their visit and we will be updated when that is determined. So that is very exciting and now may you go have a great week. 